you can start. Welcome, I'm Gigi Godwin, President and CEO of the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce. And it's a pleasure to welcome our Board of Directors, our Advisory Board, members and invited guests to this afternoon's guest speaker presentation. As a reminder, we will be recording today's presentation, which will be posted on our YouTube channel. And of course, Juliet has, has hit record, there we are. Today's presentation is titled, The Current Economic Environment and Implications for Inflation. We can't wait to learn more about what the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond's outlook is on current economic conditions, including the impact of inflation and so many other issues. Please use the chat box feature to send us your questions during the presentation. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our chamber's immediate past chair and chair of our Legislative Affairs Committee, Director, Government and Community Affairs, Montgomery County and Federal Strategy for Suburban Hospital, Leslie Ford Weber. Over to you, Leslie. Thank you, Gigi, and my title is way too long. So, <laughs> uh, so our chamber's mission, of course, for all of you is to accelerate the success of our members. And one of the ways that we do that is to provide the right information at the right time, and most importantly, the, from the right experts. And today is a perfect example. So Tom Barkin is the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, and he's been in this position since 2018. He serves on the Fed's chief monetary policy body, the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC, and is also responsible for bank supervision in the Federal Reserve's technology organization. He is uh, on the ground continuously in the 5th District, which covers South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, D.C., West Virginia, and most importantly, and dear to our hearts, Maryland. So his engagement in the region has brought real attention to the areas facing economic challenges, uh, and it's particularly the reason why we're so pleased to recognize the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond at our June 8th event. So today, it gives me just great pleasure to welcome Tom back uh, to have this discussion. Um, thanks, Leslie, and um, great to be back with you virtually. Welcome from Cary, North Carolina. Um, uh, I, th I thought what I might do is just talk for eight to 10 minutes on what's happening uh, on the economy, and then I'd love to take questions and, and, uh, and corrections. So if I have anything wrong, I definitely want to hear uh, if people see things differently. But I'll, I'll give you my best sense and we'll go from there. Um, I think I'm going to phrase it as a temperature check. Um, the Fed's been working on high inflation. And I'll give you my sense of where the temperature, where the thermometer is. But then I'd be open to, to yours as well. And as always, these are my thoughts and not those necessarily of anybody else uh, in the Federal Reserve System. So I'll start with demand, and what I'd say is demand is uh, cooling, but it's not yet cold. Um, the Fed has raised uh, rates uh, 500 basis points in the last 14 months. Uh, you can clearly see that impact in the interest-sensitive sectors like housing or manufacturing or business investment. And over the last couple of months, we've finally started to see consumer spending and retail sales start to settle. But I, but I say it's cooling. I, I, I want to be clear. I don't think it's yet cold. And, and why is that? Um, I think uh, the pandemic is still with us, and I don't mean the public health part, uh, thankfully, but the economic dislocation. Um, there's still about a trillion dollars in excess savings and trillions more in equity and housing wealth that are still funding consumption. Good spending is still well over uh, pre-COVID levels. Fiscal outlays are continuing, the infrastructure bill being uh, the most obvious piece of that. Uh, order backlogs are still being backed out, are still being worked out. Um, uh, and so that's the core demand picture. But I, I do want to talk for a second about the banking sector. I saw some banks on the list and you guys may have some views. Uh, there are challenges in the banking sector, and I think they're likely to further cool demand. And in particular, a couple sectors are at risk of being put on ice. Um, we've had three banks fail in the last two months, all for what seemed like idiosyncratic reasons. Investors are pressuring the valuations of others. Now, bank failures can challenge depositor confidence, but so far the system's held up well. Deposit flows are stable. Uh, banks are working hard to have adequate liquidity. And I'm encouraged by the resilience I'm seeing, at least in the banks that I'm talking to, which are those in my district. But even resilient banks can affect the broader economy if in order to protect their liquidity uh, or protect their capital, they choose to tighten access to credit. And that kind of pullback 
could limit consumer spending and curtail business investment. And that's particular risk on sectors like small businesses uh, or commercial real estate. If I turn to the supply side, you know, I'll say the supply bottlenecks we've seen are by and large thawing. Commodity prices have come down, transportation backlogs have seized. Uh, products are broadly available again, with just a few exceptions like switch gears or, or cars. Um, if I talk about the labor market, um, I think it's, if anything, it's gone from red hot to merely hot. Um, uh, job openings are still elevated, uh, but they're falling from their pandemic highs. Quit rates seem to be settling, uh, particularly with professionals uh, who are sensitive to the recent rounds of layoffs in technology and support and overhead functions. And supply is getting a boost as well due to a welcome rebound in participation and in immigration. But it's still a challenge. And what I like to say is uh, you do not have a cooling labor market when unemployment is 3.4%, which is the lowest since May 1969. Um, employers have struggled over the last couple of years to find workers, and they're just reluctant to let them go. And so you're still seeing jobs ad added at a much higher than normal pace, uh, 222,000 a month for the last three months. Um, you know, the break-even rate would probably be 90,000. Uh, wage growth remains elevated as well. Um, finally, inflation, it's down from its peak, uh, but it's still simmering, or maybe it's even boiling over. Um, a reminder, our target's 2%, uh, but 12-month headline CPI was at 4.9% in April. Core was at 5.5% in April. Um, monthly measures of the median, which I think is a helpful way to look at the breadth of inflation, haven't come in at levels consistent with our target in even one month uh, since the spring of 2021. So it's hard to say we're about done. It's hard to say we're about to hit our target when we haven't even approached it for one month uh, in the last two years. So what is it gonna take for inflation to come down to our target? Uh, there's a lot of theories uh, out there. At first, many thought inflation would be transitory uh, as the fiscal stimulus faded, the enhanced unemployment uh, ended and the economy fully reopened. That obviously proved too optimistic. Um, then it was easy to imagine a year and a half ago that the fixing of supply chains and lower commodity prices would reduce cost pressure and feed through to prices. And some of that's happened. And I think it's helped bring inflation down from its peak. But I said, you know, supply chains are largely open, commodity prices are down, and inflation is still much higher than the target. Um, you could argue we raised rates and shrunk our balance sheet aggressively last year. And it was possible with the Fed so visibly on the case that expectations would plummet and bring actual inflation down. And market measures of expectations have actually dropped a lot, but realized inflation's yet to, to follow suit. And what I think going on is, you know, after, uh, for the last two decades, uh, businesses have been clear in their mind and consumers have been clear in their mind that inflation was a settled fact. Anything over 2% was a reason to go shop around uh, or to reject a supplier. Um, but what happened over the last two years is all the talk was about inflation. Um, all the action was on inflation. And businesses found elast inelasticity that they hadn't had the courage to test for previously. And so they're still looking to find more. Um, at the same time, supply chain challenges have worn down purchasing departments uh, who now seem more willing to accept increases at a time when volatility makes cost structures more opaque and availability more important. And consumers just get exhausted uh, from shopping around. Um, it was really interesting to look at their earnings reports in the first quarter of the consumer products companies. Almost all of them think Pepsi, Coke, P&G, Conagra. They had revenues up 10%, but the 10% revenue growth was 13% price growth and 2 or 3% volume loss. And so that's the business model they're in. And it's just awfully hard to back off of that until customers make you change, uh, either because you know competitors make you change or or they get tired of it. So I suspect demand's gonna to need to cool further for inflation to settle down. Now, uh, there is a plausible story out there. And the plausible story says that the lagged effects of our rate moves and our balance sheet moves, along with weakening consumer balance sheets and tightening credit conditions are gonna bring demand down relatively quickly and inflation down right after that. Um, you could add to that risk that an outside event like a debt ceiling disruption could do the same. But, you know, that's a good story. Uh, I'm still waiting to be convinced that that story is right. Um, and, and so I'm watching both demand and inflation quite carefully. 
if there aren't compelling signs that they're slowing, then the Fed's going to need to look uh, and ask itself the question of whether we need to do more. And I would say, I realize that creates the risk of a more significant slowdown. But if there's one thing I just want to emphasize is that everybody hates inflation. Everybody hates it. It creates uncertainty. It feels unfair. It's frankly exhausting. And if there's one lesson from the 70s, which many of us remember, it's that if you back off on inflation too soon, then it comes back even stronger, which then requires us to do even more with even more damage. And so with inflation high and broad-based and persistent, that's just not a risk I, I want to take and I don't think you want me to take. Um, I should add uh, that not every slowdown is 2008, and we just all have PTSD from 2008, we should acknowledge. Uh, and in particular, I think the labor market is likely to be much different. The, the icon of 2008 was the auto worker sidelined in you know, the Rust Belt, um, or maybe the construction worker you know, out of work as, as home prices plummeted. But, um, but those are the segments where workers are shortest today. Right. If you look at the most recent layoff announcements, what you'll notice is that they've targeted support and overhead functions, not front lines. Now, nothing's good. It's not good to target anybody. But I, I will say people with a college degree, professionals, <coughs> they repot much more quickly than those without a college degree. The unemployment rate is less than 2% for those with a college degree. They typically have savings. So the impact on spending is less as well. So I just we may well have a slowdown, but I'd just say the trauma of any slowdown is likely to be different this time and hopefully less. So let me pause there and um, uh, I'm open, uh, Leslie, to any questions uh, or, or comments or input. I think you're on mute, Leslie. Leslie? I think Ron Pierre Vincenzi has a question. Yep. Nope. Sorry. I was just saying that frozen there for the screen for a second. So I have a question first and then we'll go to Ron's. Um, but Ron made great use is a great example for everybody of using the chat. So do that or the raise hands function. Um, Tom, you, you started, you spent quite a bit of time talking about inflation and you just had a side comment that businesses are still finding inelasticities uh, mm -hmm. as their price. So what are some examples of the things that businesses are still finding as we endure what seems like we've, haven't we already found it all in the last two to three years? <laughs> well, um, so like I spoke to a company, may even be a Montgomery County company that is in the building systems uh, business for office buildings. And so you can't think of a worse place to be, right? Uh, with with uh, uh, occupancy down with, you know, people not going to the office all the time. And they said, yeah, you know, so we're going to increase our prices 10%. I said, how could you be increasing your prices 10%? And the answer was, well, it worked last year. We might as well give it a try. And I think that is a lot of the mindset you, you get. It is um, you know how it works. If you increase prices, it goes straight to the bottom line as so long as the customers don't leave. And why uh, in an old world, you might have imagined the customers would leave immediately. Today, people are giving it a shot. Another good example would be uh, college tuition. Um, for the last 10 years, uh, boards of directors, boards of trustees have been telling college presidents, you know, we need to make college more affordable, don't increase tuition. Well, if you look at private colleges, they all increase tuition four, five, six percent, much higher than before. And the conversation in those boardrooms is inflation is out. Why wouldn't you do it? I just think the burden of proof has shifted. And so people are trying. That doesn't mean they'll succeed. It doesn't mean they'll succeed. But I think people are giving it that try. Yeah, that goes exactly to the point Ron was making in his question in the chat, though, because Ron, you're in, correct me if I'm misreading this or I get it from your summary, but your board in its meeting this week said the feedback you're getting from your customers is that you can't raise prices. They've hit the yeah, limit so, and they're done. Yeah, so they, they, of course, there's always different examples. So I'm asking, how often is the opposite happening where there's certain sectors, as there always is, who are struggling and cannot absorb price increases? And is there any... Is there any impact on the other side that perhaps that can suppress inflation? Are you seeing that or, or not? Yeah, it, it's great. Um, so I just did roundtables here in North Carolina with uh, four different sets of businesses. And for sure, it's the case that not every sector does it. And, you know, we had 2% inflation for 20 years. When we had 2% inflation, it didn't mean that every company in every sector raised prices 2%. In fact, interestingly, 
goods prices were basically zero for 20 years. You know, TV costs kept coming down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and services prices went up about 3% a year for 20 years. And medical was even higher than that, you know, as a part for a long time of it. Um, the sectors that are having the most problems, and, and I'm not sure I know your sector, but hospitals is a classic example where their costs oh, are up. It's healthcare. Yeah. yeah, their costs are up a ton. Uh, Medicare is not raising rates much. Uh, private payers aren't raising rates uh, much. And so the, the, the hospital segment's really uh, in a squeeze. Um, I think health pharmaceuticals, it depends where you sit. Um, you know, the generics, I think, are much, much tougher than, uh, you know, the branded, but I'm not an expert on that. Um, you know, I was talking today with a bunch of small businesses. Um, the ones who are in the good sectors actually feel a little bit more pricing power, it felt to me, than, you know, I, I talked to someone who runs a European hot wax business as, as her business, and she said materials are up a ton, but she just can't pass it on. People are going to walk out. Somebody else in a brew pub, same thing. They just feel like there's some price points you can't go uh, beyond. So I, I'm not trying to say this is everywhere, um, but, but maybe a good way to think about it is in terms of variability. Um, after 20 years of 2% inflation, the range of what people thought was possible got very, very narrow, right? And now just having had the experience, there's some people who can't do it, but there's a lot of people out there on the tail still. Um, an interesting fact is after the whole Volcker era, um, which we all remember painfully, or many of us remember painfully, um, inflation came down rapidly, but then it stayed at about 4% for three or four years. It didn't get sustainably down to 2% for 10 years after Volcker. And I just wonder how much of that is, once you've had the experience of raising prices, you just don't want to put the weapon away too quickly. If you have to, you have to, but if you don't have to, you know, you're going to give it a shot. I'm going to take the question from the chat next, and then Bob will go to you. So uh, Linda Hauke asked you to comment a little bit further on your sense of why uh, those with college degrees are finding, I think the word you used was repot, that they can uh, find a new place for themselves than um, perhaps those. And uh, if that's a question that you want to pass off to someone else, I do see that Dr. Spence, the president of Washington, one of our uh, universities, is on as well. So we'll start with you, Tom. I'll give my answer to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a, uh, you know, past is never exactly the future, but I will say um, the stats for those with a college degree are uh, unbelievably compelling, whether it is uh, income or wealth or health or longevity uh, or uh, resilience. And I presume that's because, you know, one set of skills can morph into a slightly different set of skills. Um, the journal had an article in the last couple of days that was interesting, asking the question of whether the future would be different. You know, if artificial intelligence comes in and takes away a lot of jobs of college-educated people, uh, what would happen? But you know, we've had lots of technology over the years, and to me, the issue isn't the loss of the job; it's the ability to train yourself up to do the next job. And I think the more education you have historically, and I hope and expect in the future. Uh, the better able people are going to be, be people are going to be to be able to do that. And Dr. Spence may want to rebuttal, but I trust not. <laughs> no, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think we need to start preparing our students for jobs in the future. And I think uh, the technology enhances the human effort and the human effort, I think, will always be there. Um, the great uh, thing to follow is chess. Um, you may remember 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, IBM's Watson famously beat the chess champion in the world. Um, but of course, what they're learning is that a, a grandmaster with a computer is better than a grandmaster, and a grandmaster with a computer is better than just a computer. Yeah. Great. Bob, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, Tom, thank you for all of your insight. Um, this is a, a question coming kind of from the real estate sector. And uh, there's some great questions in the chat that we're going to get to here in a second about the fact, you know, why is 2% a magic number and why, why not higher? And I appreciate your insights on the need to tame inflation to not cut rates too early. But as a real estate owner and as someone who is watching rates and deals with banks, and we're now looking at rates that are three, 400 basis points above where they were, we're looking at billions of dollars in loans coming due in the next year or two. 
Some of them in the office sector, which as you know, is decimated because people aren't returning to work. Retail is getting hammered by online. And you know, one of the biggest owners of a lot of this other than your really big banks, regional banks. And mm -hmm. I can't help but wonder and or worry, and I'm not suggesting that we have to, all this is, I, your job is a tough one, an incredibly tough one, because whatever you guys come up with effectively dictates how the real estate sector and how the, the regional bank sector work. I was wondering, how are you handicapping that? We've had three banks fail. I recognize they've had some issues, but commercial real estate, bank rates, regional banks are all tied together. And candidly, it's, it's rough. And so I'm just yeah. going go from here. Yeah, so I think, uh, I, I guess I'm just going to uh, say thank you for appreciating how hard our job is, because I think it is hard. Um, I don't think it was that hard last year, um, because last year you had three and a half percent unemployment and seven or eight percent inflation and uh, rates at zero. And that just wasn't the right answer. And so, you know, I think moving as quickly as you could to a level that was somewhat restrictive was the right answer. And, you know, hopefully we did that well, but that was the, the mission. Um, you know, where you are this year, where we are this year is the question of inflation is bad. Everybody hates it. We need to do something about it. Uh, unemployment is bad. Everybody hates it. We need to do something about it with the minimum cost to unemployment. You know, stressing real sector banks or any other sector, you know, isn't a good thing. It's a bad thing, but it's all in the pursuit of, you know, how do you drive the balance? And what I've been saying publicly, and I believe is, you know, the, the time for moving really quickly on the rate thing is over. This is now a place where you can move gradually and you want to feel your way to what's the right level of rates. And what's done is done. We're not going to go back to zero tomorrow because it makes no sense when you've still got high inflation. But, you know, now we're at a level where I do believe we're restraining the economy, certainly multiple sectors like real estate. But do you have to do more? We'll see. And I think that comes down to the question of um, is the plausible story I referenced one that you start to see where demand starts to come down and inflation starts to come down? And that then means it's working. Or is the plausible story one that isn't happening, in which case you have to stop and reassess? You know, I'll add, and I really do believe this, we're not doing this into a vacuum economy or a model economy. Um, you know, the economy still has a lot of the COVID effects still in it, whether that be the fiscal stimulus and the excess savings and the excess wealth that was created, or, um, you know, the fact that people have rotated their spending and living habits. And so that just makes it tricky in terms of, you know, it's not like um, uh, there's any proven model for exactly how to do this. The final thing I'll say is, and I may be proven wrong on this, but you know, nobody had a playbook for COVID, but we've actually done commercial real estate before and banks have done commercial real estate before. And we have had you know, office challenges. And I don't think the banking system has been naive about real estate. In other words, they know this is a classic test that has been stressed over and over again within the banks and by the regulators. And so I just, you know, it is true that we're going to have losses in the commercial real estate sector. I'm not, you know, saying anything different about that. But this isn't a new problem. And my hope and expectation is that the banks are prepared for that. And that's why they've been building capital. We've got some great questions in the chat. And one of them ties in, you just mentioned, but, you know, do we have to do more? Has something changed? And Chris Brew from Donna Hope is asking us, you know, what in a sense is magical about that 2% Fed target? Um, and Chris's note cites some of the changes you've just, you know, coming out of the pandemic. And do you have a personal opinion on whether the, the target should be something else? Should it be two and a half? Should it be 3%? Well, I, I've advocated uh, publicly for a range as opposed to a number. You know, I think uh, false precision is a danger uh, for anyone. And so if the range were one and a half to two and a half or the range were one to three, I'd be perfectly comfortable with it. Um, let me, uh, let me make a theoretical argument and then a practical argument. So on the theoretical side, I mean, uh, uh, there's been a lot of work on why two might be the right number. Most central banks around the world have had to be the number. By the way, it worked extremely well for 30 years. And so throwing something out because you have inflation high in one year feels aggressive. But that, that's the theoretical. The practical thing is the Fed really only has one weapon and it's credibility. And uh, once we get to 2%, I think it's very legitimate to have a debate about whether it's the right number or whether it's a range or whatever. But I think abandoning the number before you get to 2% uh, 
uh, is a really good way to throw your credibility away. And, you know, I describe it as, uh, for those of you who golf, and I do, um, you know, once you start giving yourself three foot putts, then the world's going to think you're going to give yourself six foot putts or 20 foot putts. And I think that is the risk we've got here is that uh, if we change it willy nilly, just because we're not at it, I think you've lost credibility in controlling inflation at all. And so that, that's where I am. It's not about the number being the right number, but once you say you're going to hit something, it's not good form to, you know, uh, stop because it's hard. Mm -hmm. So one of the other questions came in um, and, um, from uh, Tony is saying, you know, in his sense, and though we just talked about some exceptions, there really isn't an incentive for anyone to lower prices once you've hit a certain level and you're still, so, you know, so do are folks just using it? Inf is inflation the tool to tell people, yeah, maybe you should, you know, your, your, your price increase is false. You know, it's just a reflection of the inflation and you could actually do something different with that. I'm not positive I understand the question, but I'll, yeah, I'll let say, me. I'm probably not rephrasing it well. Tony, do you want to jump in here and unmute if you can? Maybe he's stepped away for a second. Yes, we'll that, no, it, sorry about that. Yeah, it just the the, the whole pipe thing about pricing is, uh, you know, I used to say, "Oh, Kevin Maryland, uh, I, I I'm I'm getting a drink. It's cost this." And if I go to the South, it's going to be cheaper. That's not happening anymore. So there's there's nothing. What's driving the price increases? Are are, are we using inflation as an excuse because it, mm -hmm. it happens to be going on? Oh, I can raise my prices. I'll get away with it because everybody's doing it. And, mm -hmm. and yet there really isn't a basis for raising their price other than that. You know, it's not costing them more possibly. You know, some some are it is expensive, but other places it's not expensive. You know, they. Yeah. They didn't have to raise their prices at all, but they can because everybody else is doing it and they can get away with it. But hopefully that clears it up a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And, and you win the interesting, most interesting background. I'm going to need an explanation of that at some point. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, look, I think um, uh, inflationary dynamics are complicated. Uh, there's no question in my mind that it started because of the combination of uh, uh, escalating oil prices and because of the Ukrainian conflict, which led to cost pressures, escalating wages because, um, you know, labor shortages coming out of COVID and supply chain challenges, which gave air cover, uh, if you will, to people to go to their customers who had not seen big price increases for years and say, I've got to do it now. And, you know, I always put myself in the mind of a Home Depot purchaser, merchandiser, because They've been, really been very instrumental in keeping prices down. And, you know, Home Depot used to say, don't bring me a price increase. I'm just going to take the business to China. Well, you couldn't do that during the supply chain stuff. So that's where it started. And I do believe that a lot of businesses had genuine cost pressure and felt the need to pass it on. I also believe there are other businesses that said, hey, here's an opportunity to make more money. I don't blame them for, you know. Then, you know, you price however you choose to price and customers have the ability to buy it or not buy it. But, you know, both of those things happened. Real cost pressure that led people up. But second is an environment where inflation became an okay word again and people started using it. And so uh, I feel the same way on inflation coming back down, that there's some segments where their input costs have come down. Uh, think lumber for a second. It's very visible. And so lumber prices have come back down. And you know, that's what happens. It's the same thing as costs go up and costs go up. But there's a whole nother segment of people who aren't bringing their prices or their price increases down quite yet. And I don't, again, I don't blame them. They're just, you know, operating businesses, but that's how that goes. We um, wanted to switch gears for a second and talking about the labor market um, mm -hmm. with some of our questions here. You mentioned that um, you know, it's it's not red hot anymore, but it is still hot. We have the lowest unemployment, I think you said, since 1969. And that's certainly the experience. Our our favorite brew pub here has a question, um, is still having trouble finding people to come work, um, even though wages have gone up, benefits are better. You know, did the employees go away or just what's happening? Yeah, so um, it's a big picture. We have 3 million fewer workers here than you would have expected given current trends. Um, uh, the story's changed a bunch during COVID. For a while, it was a she session. 
but that's not the case anymore. Women's participation is back up. For a while, it was immigration being way down. That's really not the case anymore because there have been a bunch of visas approved in the last uh, last year. But the biggest number is people 55 and up, and really it's 65 and up. And there's two elements to that. One of it is just demographics. I mean, the entire country got three years older, and we always knew this demographic bubble was happening, and we got three more years into it. Put differently, the youngest part of the baby boom, which is people born in 64, are now 59, right? And so that whole group of people that we've been talking about retiring for years is now three years older and a lot more retired. And that's a million and a half or two million. But there's also been a drop in participation by people 65 and up. Uh, so it's not just that they got older, it's also that each age is participating at a lower rate. And you can imagine lots of reasons why that's the case. Uh, 401ks got maxed out, um, uh, didn't want to take the risk of uh, getting COVID. Um, I think taking care of grandkids is something I hear more and more with the child care issues. Uh, we've got, I don't want to work technologically remote, whatever, whatever it is, that's come down. And so that's three, three and a half million people not in the workforce. At the same time, the economy's grown. I mean, despite COVID and everything, we have a bigger economy than we had three years ago. So more demand, less supply, that's what's happening with wages. Now, I think it's very different by segment. And so the professional segment, which I talked about earlier, um, that was hot for a while, particularly technology, but that's really cooled down uh, significantly. Um, recession risk is out there, people are not dumb. Uh, people really don't want to switch jobs, you know, when they're worried about, you know, getting being the first one out of the next job. And so what I'm hearing is that market's actually, you know, cooled down. The market that's white hot is still skilled trades. So nurses and hospitals, uh, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, truck drivers, you know, all those folks. We were short pre-COVID. We're still short. And maybe it's even worse because a lot of the spending and infrastructure and otherwise is creating demand and we're just not creating supply of people who work with their hands, if I could put it that way. The, th the third segment is the frontline service workers. And to be clear, we're still, uh, it's probably 600,000, 700,000 fewer frontline service workers than we had pre-COVID. Um, and, and as you know, you see in, when you wanna get service at a restaurant, it's still not there. Now, most everybody's kind of getting by you know, hotel cleaning is the classic example of we're doing that a little bit less frequently. Um, wait times are a little slower in a restaurant or whatever. So people are getting by. But one of the reasons why you still have job gains month after month after month is that we're adding 50 to 75,000 jobs a month in leisure and hospitality. And that's not growth. That is just replacement of jobs that were lost during COVID and, you know, finally getting people back in the market. And that's part of the reason why um, you know, despite all the talk about recessionary dynamics, you still see job growth month after month after month because we're still short. I mean, I think some of our retailers and even our restaurant community are, I, I still have the perception that people are not coming out, that the demand isn't there, that, you know, that there's been a cocooning, if you will, um, during COVID. I mean, would it, could we handle it if people finally decided to, to leave their homes and go out and buy something at the hardware mm -hmm. store instead of bringing it in from Amazon or to, uh, you know, go to the restaurant instead of DoorDash or any of those things that were well, the lifestyles changed? It, it, I mean, uh, overall economy services are basically back to where they were pre-COVID. Goods are maybe 15% higher. And so your question, I guess, comes back to are people going to still keep buying the televisions and keep, go out to restaurants or are they going to rotate their spending? You know, what's happened is all these warehouse jobs have increased because of Amazon. And so it, it's a, there's a mix issue uh, in there, but um, you know, I think, I think uh, if you look suburban uh, uh, I'd say leisure spending is back. It's definitely not the case in the urban cores. Um, and, you know, Washington's obviously the, the probably the worst example of that mm -hmm. um, with the government not being back in the office. So we look different than some of the other cities and towns. Oh, in yeah. Your, uh, okay. in yeah. Your, well, uh, no down, no downtown, no downtown looks good. So if you stay in a downtown hotel these days and you walk around on a Tuesday night and try to find a restaurant, you won't find anything open because downtowns you know, are really not populated. 
it happens that some cities are more downtown centric than others. I mean, uh, but suburban suburban is is busy and it's busy most everywhere. Uh, can I can I say something? Sorry about for, for specific. Yeah, jump in, Julie. Area. I was paraphrasing you. No, no, so you I... did a great job. You did great. I appreciate it, Leslie. Thank you, uh, and thank you for your time, sir, for being here and chatting with us. Um, one thing I've noticed just in the D.C. area in terms of the spending, and I, I ask a question about Main Street on here as well. There's no more of the happy hours because a lot of the people who live in Montgomery County, where we are, are still working from home, and so. Mm -hmm. Restaurants have lost and main streets have lost happy hour, spontaneous get togethers. There's no lunch business. There's no walking down the street and running errands during your work day. You're just ordering things from Amazon online instead. And so there's been this massive shift of wealth going from either, um, you know, sitting in their savings account to uh, spending that money, like I said, online to a place like Amazon, as opposed to spending it in your main street economy. Mm -hmm. So this huge wealth transfer has happened and all these small businesses, they've lost their entire retirement plan. They're more in debt than they were before. And now that we're quote post COVID, and I appreciate you saying that COVID is still around from an economic perspective, because it absolutely is in the small business sector, um, at least the one that I'm in. And so I just don't know what the solution to this is. Is it sort of we're at this place now where it's like, well, I guess that's the luck that you ended up with and now we need to move on. I just don't know how, how we move past that is all. Well, uh, first thing is I totally agree with you uh, about the mix shift. That's exactly what I was trying to, to get at. And, um, and also the, the you know, workers no longer creating the business around where they work. I mean, that, that's, I think that's very straightforward. We see it in our offices, in the Fed's offices too. Very, it's a very real thing. Um, you know, it's hard to know where it's going to go, um, but uh, I, I do think if we have this version of a professional recession that I was articulating as the most likely, uh, the most likely outcome, um, then I think those businesses that are focused on time in the office are going to feel more market power. And I think you will see some shift back toward office. I don't think yeah, the, the analogy I like to use is casual Fridays. Um, in the 90s, when the first day in my old office, when somebody wanted to go casual, we had a whole meeting to describe the risk that we might go casual every day. And it's true, actually, that a lot of people did go casual every day, but not at the Fed. I'm still wearing a tie. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened is eventually people who went casual every day backed off of it. And so you ended up with this dress for your day model which wasn't all the way left or all the way right. It was somewhere in the middle. And I don't think flexibility is gonna be gone. I think that's gonna be real. But I do think businesses that genuinely believe they're better when people are in person and have been fearful to declare that because they're worried about losing people are going to have a lot more courage six months from now than they had six months ago. That was actually one of our questions for you later. So thank you for, for previously. No, no. Julie had a great one here too, and um, it, you know it may be just as prevalent, you know, relevant to some of our bankers who are on the the um, on the line. But do you think there's an appetite for? And let me just write it as she says it. What do you think the appetite is for bank loans to new small businesses or even small businesses looking to expand? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the um, you know as I kind of hinted at, one of the challenges that banks have is uh, they want to preserve liquidity right now and uh, they want to make sure they have uh, uh, that they have earnings that are robust to somewhat higher deposit rates. And so uh, the way they typically do it and I suspect the way they'll do it in this downturn is you know taking a second look at marginal credits. They're not going to shut down the lending operations, at least I hope not. But you know things that are a little marginal, whether it be a marginal credit risk or a marginal sector, I think, you are going to find them to be sharpening their pencils on that, and um, and small businesses, you know, are at risk. I, I think I even said that in my statement. Commercial real estate we talked about earlier that's clearly at risk. Um, small businesses too, and so that doesn't mean there aren't small business loans out there, but I do think it's going to be, it's likely to be a tighter credit environment um, uh, for those, at least at this particular point in time. Yeah. Okay. I'm scanning both screens just to see if anyone has their hand up here. Let's let's shift gears for a second and just talk a little bit more about the Fed's work. I mean, one of the things that, of course, was so such a, a, a prevalent test in the 
when COVID came on was how quickly that happened. You know, mm -hmm. you think of, people now are, we're going to look back to where were you on March 11th, you know, 2020, and just how uh, stunning that was when conditions can change rapidly. So how do you make decisions in that environment? You know, how do you, I mean, I guess we're asking you, how do you update? you know, your understanding of where things are going when there really isn't any, you know, there's no, the COVID tractor had to be built, mm -hmm. for instance, to give us real-time data. And we certainly don't seem to have that for economic conditions. So what's the best way to stay on top of information? So I really do try, and, and COVID was a huge incentive to force myself into real-time data. So for example, um, Bank of America, and they're not the only one, uh, but they publish every two weeks. Uh, credit card sales for each of 15, or roughly 15 uh, industry segments, uh, year over year, four year over four year growth. And having watched it now week after week after week for three years, I feel pretty calibrated on knowing what it's telling me. And consumer spending is two thirds of the economy. And that gives me a pretty good sense of, you know, the spend levels in two thirds of the economy. Um, uh, if you look at the uh, unemployment numbers, they come out once a month, but we actually get ADP numbers every week and an initial claims every week. So there's a weekly sense of what's happening in the labor market that isn't a perfect predictor, but gives you a good sense of what's happening, you know, on the job side. And then you guys know this, but I'm, you know, I'm in North Carolina this week, but I'm in Virginia all went next week. I'm on the ground every day. I've, I've literally done seven roundtables in the last two days with farmers, with manufacturers, with small businesses to ask them these questions of what are you seeing in terms of demand? Uh, what are you gonna be doing in terms of pricing? Has your labor market issue been solved? Because I'm really trying to stay on top of it. And it, it requires some confidence in your ability to synthesize because not everyone agrees. But these sessions that I do with you guys too, it really helps me to know, you know what I'm hearing. And almost every session, someone will tell me I'm dead wrong, which I appreciate, um, at least I do later. Um, and and how else are you going to figure out uh, the economy? Now, if your action is, okay, that you think you know what you're talking about, Tom, but how does the battleship of the Fed get geared up to move at a time of crisis? Um, that's hard. That's hard. Um, uh, Jay obviously plays a critical role in that. Um, if you go back to March of 2020, um, this is you know public because we published minutes. Uh, we had a, he came back from a G20 meeting and Europe in mid-February convinced that COVID was a bigger deal, maybe it was the third week of February, convinced that COVID was a bigger deal than we had thought it was in the US. And you guys all remember, we were talking about it, but the question was kind of, is it the flu or is it gonna get stuck in China? We'd, we'd stopped flights from China. There were debates about whether that was a good idea or a bad idea. Then it was just showing up in Italy. That's, that's sort of February. Um, and he actually called around to each of us individually to have a conversation, something like, hey, this must be, and we had a special meeting on a Monday night, I wanna say it was the first week of March of 2020, where we reduced rates 50 basis points. And so that was, if you will, our first salvo. And then um, we had our normal scheduled meeting for March 17th, I think it was. And I remember we had our board meeting on a Thursday before, and you'll remember this, the NCAA canceled its first round games and mm -hmm one of the NBA players walked off and they suspended the season and the market, I remember this on Thursday, the market must've dropped 700 points. I'm making that up, but anyway, it was like, and my daughter got sent home from college and as all y'all's did too. And so it was a scene. And so we ended up saying, we can't wait till Tuesday or Wednesday. We called a meeting that Sunday and that's when we lowered rates to zero and launched a bunch of the programs that we launched Monday, March 16th. So it's a consensus building process, but it can move relatively quickly. I mean, you know, that was two weeks to drop rates 150 basis points and put a trillion or two into the economy. Maybe we could have done it in 10 days. I don't know. Yeah. So it's good to know about, you know, looking for where those sources of real-time data are. And yeah. Certainly, we appreciate that you've come out and talked to us. Uh, Angela, you had your hand up. Hi. Yeah, uh, first say thanks for joining us. This topic is so relevant and timely, and you know, living um, the impacts of it in every aspect of my life from five dollar eggs to 
find the higher evidence which was the adoption of the country work. So I mean, I'm in the federal sector and to be higher for federal. And it's it's really more of a challenge to get people who actually want a job in a lot of these. But I wanted to ask but that my question was that um, you mentioned the impact from the commercial area. But if I think of, do you have any insight into the impacts on the federal side from a real property standpoint? Because most of my government um, contacts are working remote, either one or two days a week or 100%. And they've started this hoteling arrangement that doesn't seem to really work or get people in. And so what I'm um, expecting or predicting is a, a lot of government real estate, which will impact us significantly in, in the DC area, but in every location, every state uh, across the, the union. What are your thoughts on it? Let me know, Kevin. So, Leslie, I, that was fuzzy for me. I don't tell me if it was fuzzy for you, Leslie. I, but I think the it, question it was, but I heard. I think I caught about. Um, you know, we talked. You mentioned private companies in yeah. telling their employees to come back and work in person, but Angela is not seeing it with the government con. The, I agree. Your federal employees that you work with, Angela, is that it? And just this has huge impacts for us in the Washington metropolitan region. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, and, and we've had, you know, obviously the Fed is a government employer in Washington too, same kind of issue. And I think uh, it's going to be a real challenge. Um, uh, I, I believe strongly that we're better at what we do um, uh, together than apart. And that doesn't mean five days a week, every day. That doesn't mean bound to your desk, but it means an interaction model that increases collaboration, improves values, allows connections, uh, you know, uh, focuses people on the job at hand. Um, I've often said that in the private sector, two different executives with different beliefs on it are just gonna go compete with each other. And we'll see who wins that in the private sector. Somebody will have lower real estate costs. Somebody will have higher connectivity. We'll see who wins that. Somebody will have one set of employees, someone have another set of employees. We'll see who wins that. And I have a bias, but you know, maybe I'll be wrong. In the public sector, there's none of that competition. And, and frankly, it's hard to measure productivity in, in our shop anyway. And so you end up in a world of assertions and Washington is a place where uh, commute times are long. Uh, it's expensive to live in town. Um, and so um, there's a lot of employees who don't make that much money who their own personal productivity is significantly enhanced by not being there. And, you know, uh, do I think there'll be an executive uh, leadership change at some point that will, um, whether it be within an agency or across the government, that will bring a lot of people back? I do. Uh, but is that happening soon? I don't see any evidence of it. And I think all of the implications that you were hinting at, whether that be you know real estate values or retail vibrancy, are at risk if we don't do that. There's another question here from Tony, who is a reader, because he mentioned a, a book that we want to know if you're familiar with, um, Secrets of the Temple, How the Federal yeah. Reserve Runs by William Grider. Great. Um, yep. And he said he reread it last year. And it just you mentioned the 1970s inflation uh, and that we would many of us would remember it um, and that he's struck by this era does seem to be sort of consistent with. Um, you know, what Grider reports during the Carter administration. Do you see parallels that way too? And what did you learn from that period? Yeah, so I've read that book uh, three times, believe it or not. <laughs> once once in the 80s. Uh, and then uh, uh, once I was on the board of the Atlanta Fed. And so I read it when I joined the Atlanta Fed board in 2009. And then once when I took this job in 2018. So it's a really, really, really uh, good book. Inside Baseball on, on how all that went down. Um, so uh, the biggest similarity uh, between the 70s and 80s and today is that fighting inflation is hard. And there's a lot of pressure on the Fed from politicians in particular to say, you know, don't damage the economy, inflation will be fine. And, you know, hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. And so that's uh, the part that's similar. The part that I believe is different, we'll see, is that after 15 years or 14 years, you know, 1969 to 13 years to 1982 of not really fighting inflation, expectations had really spiked that inflation could never get under control. If you look at long-term bond uh, yields in the early 80s, they were over 10%. And 
And that's what you do when you don't believe inflation is ever going to come down. If you look at long-term bond yields now, they're in the 3% range. And that's because they must believe inflation is going to come down. And so controlling inflation is a lot easier if the world believes that inflation is going to come down than it is if they don't believe it. So the similarity is the pressure. The difference, though, is I think there's a lot more confidence that we're going to get inflation under control in this era than there was in the early 80s. I will say that's not an entitlement. That's just a result of a bunch of decades of good management of inflation. And if we don't do what we need to do, then this is kind of what I was getting at with my point on the inflation target. If we don't do what we're going to do, I think we're going to lose confidence in people. And if we lose that confidence, it's going to be even harder. Yeah. I'm scanning here. I don't see questions coming in. Gigi, I'm going to give you an opportunity here. You've been listening so far. What, what else should we be talking about? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, as always, there's, there's so, so many places to dive in here. But I remember the last time we were together in person in May, and I, <laughs> I think I was expressing my skepticism that uh, that manipulating interest rates, you know, was uh, was going to affect, you know, the cost of wheat worldwide when, you know, Putin was engaged in attacking, you know, uh, Ukraine's, you know, breadbasket for any number of other countries. Mm -hmm. and, and my point was only that, you know, there's a, it's a big world out there and not everybody's in the United States. I mean, as a global economy, what happens here matters. We've talked, you know, we're, we're assuming that everybody will figure out the debt ceiling and it won't really happen. And that's a whole big thing we're not spending time on today about how horrible that would be if it actually occurred, right? Right. Also, does that mean you're not giving me credit for bringing the price of wheat down in Russia? Because it's well, actually, been, did it come actually down? been, it's down a bunch from when it, when we were last. Okay. Together. Well then, yes, I'm going to give you credit because I know I gave we you deserve, the opposite. We deserve of, no credit. We deserve uh, no credit, but I, okay. I like to take it when I can get it. But the truth is, a lot of things are going on in the world, and, and the bigger topic was we're in a global economy, and there, there, yeah. you know, wars that people start, and there are issues about, you know, who can't let go of Russian oil because, like, they don't have any options, and you know, there's a lot of other stuff going on, and I just, you know, wondered how to what, and then we still didn't have the supply chain stuff sorted out a year ago. It didn't feel like. It kind of feels like it's not entirely sorted out, even based on today's conversation. So it's not, it's more of a amusing, which is which is uh, you know it was one thing decades ago when we were all when everybody on this call was a lot younger, and we you know the Federal Reserve exercised you know pulled certain levers and could be pretty confident about getting you know certain results, but you know it's just like elections, there are snowflakes. Every one of them is unique. And this mm -hmm. point in history is another snowflake. It's unique in time. So I just wondered if you could, you know, like pull the lens back, you know, as we, because we've talked about specific issues, labor, uh, supply chain, you know, the, the fact there's this big picture of, you know, the world has big things going on, uh, wars, climate change, you know, all of that. And, you know, I just wonder more of a looking ahead. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to totally give you credit for like totally fixing the wheat price thing. <laughs> Okay, you got that one. But um, but looking ahead, you know how how do you consider those things? Just I mean, just for the benefit of those of us on on today's call, for my board members and our guests, it's like yeah. it, it would seem well, to me that adds a lot, another level of complication for your decisions. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I think um, I hope I'm wrong about this, but uh, and I've given a, a speech on this. I really believe that over the last thirty years uh, since the wall fell. Um, you know, we have all benefited economically uh, from a huge tailwind. And that includes, you know, trade with China and globalization. That includes uh, whether you uh, like it or not from a climate change standpoint, fracking and access to lower cost oil. That includes demographics, more women in the workforce, people healthier, working longer, immigration. Uh, that includes uh, e-commerce, the ability to price shop electronically and get access to all of these things were huge tailwinds economically. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe we're just halfway through and the next 30 years are gonna be every bit as good, but it's not hard to wake up and go, oops, maybe we're going the wrong way here. And the next 30 years will be deglobalization and climate transition is critically important, but it won't be cheap. And so, you know, that'll run probably the wrong way on inflation. Demographics are clearly going the wrong way and nothing's gonna change that you know, in the next 20 years, um, minimum. 
Uh, May I uh, ask you the question? You just said demographics are clearly going the wrong way. Are you saying about the lack of population growth in certain countries and the overpopulation elsewhere or, or poverty uh, and how that's affecting people's mo movement? When you say demographics, aging, what do you mean? Aging. A a aging. Growth, okay. growth, in, growth in population and the aging of the population, which means that there are more people for every young person to support, which is a drag on a bunch of uh, different elements uh, of society. And that's true here, but it's also, you know, more true in China and Japan, uh, just mm -hmm. to name, and Europe, right? And we actually have decent demographics in the States compared to the rest of the world, but they're still not great. They're still moving in a way that is less productive. And, and um, you know, it's entirely conceivable. You never want to count technology out. So there may well be a technological innovation that helps make all this easy and good, whether that be on the climate science side, if you read Bill Gates's uh, writing, he is pretty optimistic on that. Um, uh, or maybe on productivity, maybe artificial intelligence will unleash another whole thing of productivity. But I tell you, it, you know, you always have to, uh, one of the things that we do in our world is say, what are the upside versus the downside? And how do you feel about it? And I think there are a lot more downsides in my mind than there are upsides. Oh. And I don't know that I would have said that 10 years ago. I, I didn't even democracy, but you know, we should have put that in there as well. Yeah, I think we should throw, you know, will democracy survive? It's been uppermost on many people's minds, especially in this area. Yeah, yeah for sure. But I mean, all tailwinds, headwinds. Um, I think there's no question if you go back 30 years, it hasn't been perfect, you know, war on terror, all that stuff. But I mean, 30 years from an economic standpoint, it's been mostly tailwinds. And so maybe that'll continue, but I think we're at risk of a different version. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So we have to have a part two of this tailwinds, headwinds, I think you have to come back next year. And we have to see, we have to right away, like flip the coin, is it tail <laughs> headwinds or tailwinds? We need to know. And I think that might be the, you know, one of the things we're assessing, not to say that this isn't, that's not a long-term project, but I mean, I think it'll start showing itself, don't you think? Even yeah. in, in a year? Well, you know, think of your, you know, biggest global downsides, like a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Oh my you know, gosh. yeah. So that'll immediately take our biggest trade partner and our uh, biggest low cost producer out of the market, right? Because one way or another, oh. you know, and, and there's a lot of supplies, everything from generic pharmaceuticals to uh, lithium for batteries that we don't really have acceptable substitutes for. So, you know, we'll go back into supply chain land pretty quickly if that happens. You know, that'll be, you know, worth it as it always is when you go into conflict with a rival globally. But, you know, that's not going to be good for the economy. Mm -mm. No, that'll be that'll be a disaster. All I right, told my so kids load our, up on their iPhones. Nope. Let's keep our fingers crossed that that doesn't happen. Right. Oh, oh. I forgot to mention that's where they that's where they assemble all the iPhones. Now you've made it. Yeah. Personal. yeah. I know. I said to my kids, like, go go stock up because I don't know when you're well, getting the next one. Tell them Mont <laughs> tell them Montana has just outlawed TikTok and see how they react. All right. Yeah. That's, Gigi, that's a I'm whole looking. Topic. I don't see any other. Um, any questions and we are at time. Do you want to close this out? Uh, well, you know, I'll be, uh, I'm pleased to do that, Madam Chair. Thank you. Tom, you are the best. We love it when you come and share your thoughts with us. Uh, as you could tell, uh, we are a, a very uh, engaged and, uh, yeah. and an audience that loves to interact with you. I'm hoping that we're going to get to see you in person over the next 12 months to, to bring some more um, of our roundtables together, because I think that's really, I, I like to think it's helpful to you. And I yeah. do believe it's helpful to, to our um, business leaders. Happily. So let's get that scheduled. All right, so that's going to happen. And we're going to see you in a year and find out headwinds or tailwinds. That's another thing we're going to get scheduled. And with that, I just want to say thank you to Tom Barkin. Again, great presentation, as always, and great discussion. And I want to thank uh, all of the members of the board, our advisory board, our guests uh, who, were, uh, who joined us this evening. Your time is valuable, and we thank you for spending it with us. And look, we are going to have this all up on YouTube so that you can watch it again. Thanks, everybody, and good evening, and see you on June 8th for annual dinner. <laughs>